Um, most of you now, by the end of this week, will have seen me brandishing this one around, and possibly the other teachers uh, brandishing copies around. This is not the size of Manuscript 29, which is the notebook that Bunting used in that class. This is much bigger. This is the original size of the notebook that Bunting used in Belfast. So if we open it up, you'll see that there are five staves on either side. This is a very low resolution version. Just to show you the size, five staves on each size, a side. And this is a notebook that he starts in 1792 in Belfast. How informal was the meeting if it's such a, it's like sitting together with a small sketch uh, was it more about listening and, and, and some notes or? Oh, uh, this is where he writes down the tunes that the harpers are playing. Yes. So he sits with a harper, I assume, and gets them to play the tune several times. And then sometimes he has Later. several goes of okay. writing down the tune. So, for example, um, well, let me let me very briefly talk about. Uh, Manuscript 33, and then we'll spend all of our time looking at Manuscript 29, which is way and by far the, the most interesting. So, Manuscript 33 is this sort of shape and size, and as you'll see when we look through Manuscript 29, this is much neater and tidier. Mm -hmm. And that's because these are not the notebooks he's using on the fly, writing music down from the harbors. Well, in fact, he does in some places in, in Manuscript 33. But in general, these are fair, what we call fair copies of the tune. So he has time at home to sit down with his Manuscript 29, figure out all the scribbles that he did, and write out a nicer copy in Manuscript 33, which uh, has all the niceties of key signatures and treble and bass clefs and some uh, accompaniment. But the accompaniment is not necessarily what he's heard from the harpers. Indeed, it's almost, it's rarely anything to do with what he's heard from the harpers. It's usually a piano, it's a piano cut. But there, some, it's really worth looking at these because sometimes we hope that they're influenced by what the harpers were playing so we can, we can glean things even out of some of his piano accompaniments. But the, uh, the meat and potatoes of the Bunting manuscripts are the very large, well, large as in lots of pages, notebook he uses in Belfast. So, this is a typical kind of page we see. Uh, I'm missing something. I'm missing my own notes page to make sure I tell you everything I want about each page. So bear with me for two seconds. So a typical kind of page. Here, first of all, we just see these little dots. And this should be very familiar to any of us who've ever tried to write down a tune at top speed from someone whose tune we wanted. This is this looks so so usual to me. You just think, try and get the notes down. You're not worried about the rhythm. You're not worried about anything else. You're just trying to literally. When we talk about the dots on the page, here we really are seeing dots on the page. So this is the quickest way you can notate the contours of a melody. So this is what he starts off doing in Dermot Dermot O'Duda or Dermot O'Duda as he calls it. Very old ditty, not very old. Well, actually, I think it's very old and dirty because the words really are quite dirty. They're so, uh, they're so dirty that Donald O'Sullivan wouldn't publish them in his Bunting manuscripts. There are whole lines left blank and he goes, not suitable for publication. <laughs> so he's not very impressed. So it's a pretty filthy song. So I always thought this was ditty and now I realise he's saying oh, it's very old and it's, it's possibly dirty. Um, you can see on the page there's ink, there's a pencil. Look, here, here it is. Here's some pencil. <coughs> and there's an X through it also in pencil. And the X's in the manuscripts, you'll see this a lot in manuscript 29 and 33, the X's just mean when he's finished with a page, once he's made a fair copy somewhere else, then he puts an X through it to show that he's finished. So he, now, he, he has his first go at the tune. So look at the, the dots. <laughs> Second go, and so he puts in bar lines and he puts in rhythm. What's this along alongside that eighth 
about any of the teenagers here. What do you think that is? Okay, what's the rhythm in each of Well, what's the time again? Sorry? Is it to have the rhythm time again? Yes, exactly. So, this is, a, this is not an eighth note, but a sixteenth note. But he just has it coming out that way instead of going the other way. In modern uh, music, we, we, we go the other way. But he's just a bit, a bit quick and a bit busy, so it's coming out the other way. But it's just sixteenth note, dotted eighth note, sixteenth, dotted eighth note. Look, here's a similar kind of thing. Now it's on both sides of the stem. But again, he just means a sixteenth note, or what we call a semiquaver. Okay? Uh, so how many beats do we have in each bar, even though there's no time signature? How many beats are in each bar? Three. One, two, three. So how about when we get here? One, two, three, four. What's that note doing? Do we have suddenly four beats in the bar? No. no. What, what is, is it? An ornament. ornament. It's an ornament. It's slightly smaller than the others with a little, um, what do you call tail. that in any language? A little tail. tail, thank you. With a little tail. And so that's an ornament to the next note. So there you have it. You see lots of this kind of thing. And then he comes along and writes another version. So here's another tune called Podino Rafferta. Oh, uh, hang on, I, mean, I, I gave pages of each one. This is the first tune. So feel free to hand out copies of this good Christian one over there for the rest of the time. I think that's enough for everybody, including me, all of you. Now, I haven't had a chance to write the folio numbers on the pages. So if you have a pen handy, each page I give you, you can write the folio number on it. Uh, because it's quite, I think this is quite important thing to say. If you start working with, man, with these manuscripts, you'll find that you print out pages or you photocopy pages or a teacher gives you a page. And if you don't know, if you don't write on it what the page is or where it comes from in the manuscript, it's very difficult sometimes to remember afterwards. You think you'll remember, but you don't. Three months, three, three months time you won't remember at all. So, let's talk for a second about folio numbers. Okay, we're all familiar with page numbers, aren't we? So it could be page two, page three, you turn over, page four, page five. This is our normal system. But when we're talking about manuscripts, we don't often, they don't have, if they're medieval manuscripts, they're not gonna have page numbers. Um, Bunting's notebook uh, didn't have page numbers. I mean, printed things often have page numbers, but your own notebook that you're writing in often doesn't. And so we have to have ways of referring to the pages that we all agree on. So generally, when you deal with a manuscript, they literally take the first leaf. So here's a leaf. It's got a front and a back to it. So you take the leaf and you say, in a manuscript, ah, oh, this is leaf one. And it's not necessarily where the music starts, it's where the actual manuscript starts. The very first page after you open the cover, you consider the first leaf. And then the music starts on the second leaf and off you go. It's like in the book, supposed to be. When yes. You lay out, yes. You don't have number one or two. And so the Latin name for a leaf is a folio. Uh, F O L I O. Folio is a leaf. All the Italian speakers down the back. Folio. You know, folio in Italian means leaf as well, exactly. And so you're getting it from Latin and we're getting it from Latin. Folia and folio. So each Foliage. Foliage, yes, leaves, exactly. We use the same word to describe leaves. Now that's all well and good. So you can say, right, the 57th folio of a manuscript. Brilliant, we can get there. We can mark it, but, but, but how do we differentiate this page from that page? Maybe we want to talk about this page, or maybe we want to talk about that one. So the convention is that you give the folio, and you just write F for folio, and then you give the folio number, so F47, for example. And then to differentiate the front from the back, in Latin, you say that the front of something is recto, R-E-C-T-O, recto, and the back of it is verso, verso, okay? So, I mean, it's very familiar. To anybody who speaks Recto Italian? Verso. Say, say. Recto, verso. Yes, 
correct on verso you're used to in Italian. So it's the right side and the inverse, recto verso. So if I want to talk about this folio, I'll say it's F47R, folio 47 recto. And if I want to talk about this page, I'll talk about folio 47, F47V. So if you can mark the folios that uh, I've given you so far. So the first one is F17V. So you'll say manuscript 29, MS 29. Better again, you'll say bunting manuscript 29. So this one we have now is the first one? Or the second? That's 17V. Uh, the, the one you have in your hands now is the first one. So hang okay. on, let's go back. 38. The one I'm talking about <coughs> is. This one, yeah. that one. Okay. So that's, that's Bunting Manuscript 29, Folio 17 Verso. So F17V is the first one. Now, the one I'll give you now, as we'll hand out this one as well. It's Podino Rafferty. There we go. <coughs> So the next one is folio 86 verso. So F 86 V. Folio 86 verso is this one we're looking at. Now you'll see on it these numbers. You'll see these numbers on the on the page of manuscript 29. And these this is Bunting writing page numbers on it for himself. So that he could, so he knew what page things were on. So we're using folio numbers, so you only have, ever have half as many folio numbers as you have page numbers. Obviously, because page numbers, you have double the amount. So for Bunting, this was page 176. And when you, if you, Excuse yes? Me. But if Bunting wrote the, the numbers of the pages, then why is there, some, is there all this folio and because, business? Because, um, because the folio numbers are the standard system for talking about manuscripts. Because supposing Bunting got it wrong, supposing he wrote 176 and then the next page he forgot to number and then he went over and said 177. Supposing there's a mistake in his pagination, then because manuscripts are not always perfect, they're not always consistent and human beings make mistakes in them. So even if they're, that's a really good question, but even if they're paginated, I would rather just go one, two, three, yeah. and, and for myself, and know what folio I'm talking about. Okay. But if you uh, get copies of these manuscripts, as I hope many of you will over the coming months or years, if you get it on CD-ROM from Queen's University in Belfast, they use, it's really tricky, because they don't use Bunting's, they, they don't use this system. So they're, uh, Bunting's page 176 is their page 178. So it gets really confusing. They're two out. And well, they're, they're using... But that matches the folio. No, uh, no, it won't match the folio. But it's half. 86 is half. 178. Yeah, no, yeah, we're the same in general. They're, they're, they're out by two because they're following Colette Maloney's pagination system. And so she uses one in her catalogue. Queens follow that. Bunting is using a. Do you see the problem with pagination? Yes. Every, if everybody has a slightly different take on it. Supposing I think page one, uh, supposing I start off yes. and at the beginning of this manuscript, is that page one? Is that page one? <laughs> you know, is the inside of the. Okay, if this is page one, but, but I think Colette started off with this as page one. So do you see the problem? It's a nightmare. It's just this absolute, this absolute mess. So, not everybody is going to consider this page one, but some people will consider, uh, let's see, Bunting considered this page three, but I think that other people consider this page one. So you're in this nightmare of who thinks what yeah. page numbers. So if you use folio numbers, it's really clear. You just literally go by the leaf. Yeah. Um, all right, so where are we? Cross that. So have a look at this, this tune. Uh, look at the way the beaming on the, on the notes works. So we've got a six eight tune, so we have six, Eighth notes uh, or quavers in each bar. Or whatever it is. Now, normally you'd have.
have stems going all the way up or stems going all the way down if you have three notes. If you have, for example, E, F, G, all the stems will go up. Or if it's higher up on the stave, C, D, E, all the stems will come down. But what do you do if you have a note here and two notes there? Well, they should really come down, those stems, and that's what should really go up. So in the 18th century, they would do it like that and just beam it in the middle. So be aware of that kind of thing. When you see this, it's just three normal eighth notes. But it just looks slightly funny to the modern eye because we don't do it that way anymore. We do it like this, or like this. We have the line going up or coming down. But look what he does. He just literally puts it in the middle. And that's going across there. So don't be fooled. They're still just playing on eighth notes. All right? Let's go to the next one. sort of 16th, 17th, 18th century music to indicate an ornament, you just have a little, a little cross. But he's actually writing TR, so he needs a trill. Again, that you can see these little ornamental notes. By the way, if you have questions about any of these pages as we go, ask questions, because there may be things that I think are obvious and are not so obvious. Did he use the, the key that he heard or that was most? Oh, yeah, very good question. Um, Sometimes, in manuscript 29, yeah, he doesn't write in fancy keys, so they're much, they tend to be much closer to harp keys. But I don't know that he's actually, I mean, this is entirely plausible because it's got one sharp F sharp, which is one of the traditional tunings. So it's a completely, uh, it's a completely plausible thing, actually, until you get to here, that that's not natural. So there's obviously something strange going on there that I won't go into in this class. Um, so we've dealt with that in other classes, what, what do you do with these chromaticisms? That's, uh, it's unusual in manuscript 29 to find an anomaly like that where all the S are F sharp and you have an F natural. And I think the reason uh, being this page, isn't, this isn't a tune he took from a harper. That's why it's quite neat, more neat and tidy than usual. Um, it's because I think he took a whole bunch of tunes out of Neil or a source very like Neil. So there's a whole great sway in manuscript 29. Um, of tunes that are identical or very, very close to Neil. So I think this is why he's got that. It's, it's coming from a different source. <coughs> now, again, to answer your question, Michal, here we have two, this is in also manuscript 20. Oh, I should be giving you the phony numbers as we go. So you can write them down. What are you missing? Have you got the first two? You do? Yeah. All right, so Planoff's Delight is folio 35 versa. We don't have yeah. it. In there. Oh, I have given it to you. <laughs> How remiss of me. Call this hospitality. Okay. Can read it next. Oh, yes. yes. Sorry, yes. They're on the board. Thank you, Krista. Thank you. At this time of the week, I can hardly, I can hardly speak in sentences. You know how it is. So let me give you those guys. Yeah. Oh yeah, but hang on, sorry. I thought I was the only one looking at those. Yeah. They're not all. Don't go look at the page numbers. No. Because, because it looks wrong. It's really page 76 and something. <coughs> so that was that was from private consumption. I haven't sorted out all the page numbers. So how many 
you look at the folio numbers, it doesn't quite good. Come on in, Brendan. And, and they're all manuscript 29. Oh, uh, all of these ones are manuscript 29. So, Yes, I'd realised you were going to be looking at that, so I would have done very uh, quickly. What about all this stuff at the end? What's going on there? What's that? Carrying on? So it could be a carrying on thing, but it's not, in fact. It's repeat. Sorry? Repeat from the start? Uh, no, look, if he wants you to repeat, he does, yeah. he does our, the normal thing we know, which indicates a repeat. Anybody know what this kind of squiggle is? Carry on and elaborate. Oh, that sounds nice. I like your, I like your reasoning, but no. Um, in the 16th, 17th and 18th century, when you draw your double bar lines, often you'd keep going with me and go, Ch -ch -ch. it's just a nice little decoration at the end. You often see that in European manuscripts as well. It's just a nice way of sort of tapering off. So it's, it's, uh, it's okay. only ornamental. It's not functional. Okay. Uh, we still have time for this. Sorry? We still have time for making yeah. the well, uh, Yes. Yeah. Well, it, well, it's just, it's, it's a sort of little scribal thing, you know. Yeah. They're much more decorative in the 18th century with their pens than we are. Mm -hmm. So he would do that. Um, so in, in this piece you can see he's put in a time signature. What's the time signature? Three, four. Three, four. So this thing is a four. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think there's nothing else strange or exciting on that page. Go to the next one. Was, was Canops a harpist who, who you recorded it from? Do you think? No, no. Canops Delight is a piece that's in Neo. And I can't remember anything about that tune at the moment. But it's not, um, Canops isn't a harpist as far as I know. So this one, you see the page number is wrong again, don't look at the page number, but it is uh, folio 33 recto, and it's page 71. This is actually, the, these numbers that are incorrect, they're the numbers that are on the <coughs> CD-ROM from Queen's University. You can see how far out they are, 67 to 71. They, they just don't tie in at all. So I don't, even, I don't even look at those. So this one, what's interesting about this? So the time signature here is what? 6-4. Six, four. Six, six, four. Four. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, she should share the We were talking about Neil earlier on, uh, Michal. These are all tunes from Neil. Very nice tune. <laughs> Does it also change from, from S to E? Say again? This also change in the S to E. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, the E flat to E. Yeah, so another indication that he hasn't got this from a harper. Now, how about this sign? Any, any idea what this is? Oh, it's not. Has anybody come across this in modern music? It's the same mm -hmm. sign in modern music. Mm -hmm. Anne, you might know this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dal segno. If we say it in Italian, you're going to know exactly. This, this is called. Dal segno, and usually say dal segno al fine. So, mm. what's a segno in English? Sign. A sign. sign. Yeah, so it's a sign. So, it's a little way of saying, uh, you know, do something from here to somewhere else in music. Uh, now, how does it work in this piece? I'm not sure how it works. So, this is the first time bar, so presumably you go back to the beginning. It might be that when you get to the end, that this you do a little post food thing, yeah da 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 da, yeah da 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 da, and so on. Mm -hmm. That you go back to here and then to the end. So note the trill signs. Mm -hmm. Notice pencil markings of different uh, page numbers. Also other stuff over here. On. Yes, we need to get that one. Or do we? Oh, yes, thank you. Keep reminding me. Just one of the last. <coughs> yeah. The fact that it, it, it was um, not from a heart, heart would probably mean this wouldn't be the case, but could it have been a Dublin? 
like, like going up an octave the first time around? Uh, well, it so could be, but that's not what that sign means. That sign just literally means you go to here. And usually it it's, gives you more information. In art music, it'll say, at the end of a piece, it'll say, that's in your It means go back to wherever that, that sign is and then go from there to the end. Is what it normally, so it doesn't have repercussions for, for um, oct octaves. But this is the, you gave us the 33 R now. Yeah. Well, I gave you the wrong one. No, oh, no well, it's the last one from the PowerPoint. No, I'm not understanding what you're saying. What have I done wrong? No, no, you've done nothing wrong, but they are, they are already one page ahead. You're one page ahead. Oh, I see. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Otherwise, we go. All right, so that's your folio 33 recto, which we just looked at. But actually, I did want to do that because I wanted to get on to the next one. So in this piece, you can see things scribbled out. But he's had a, he's had a, a go at writing down uh, your favourite piece, Michael, mm -hmm. Jointure. It's by Conlon. So he has a go. <laughs> For some reason, he's not very pleased with his different versions. <laughs> so he just crosses it all out and starts again. <laughs> If that was a dot, then it would be a fermata or pause. But in fact, that thing in the middle is a three. It's another ornament. Ah, no. What does that? What's it likely to be? It has a three under a. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. It's playing three notes in the time of two. So that's all that is. <coughs> so it, where you'd normally have two sixteenth notes, he squeezed in a third, and you'd have to play three of them where normally you play two. Now, look at something like this, where you have stems going in both directions. This is what he does when he makes mistakes, because we all make mistakes when we're writing down tunes, and he has really nice ways of reminding himself what, it, what the new thing is. So look, we expect we've got a B and an A and an A and a G. This A, A, G are connected, and the stems are going down. That's what we expect, high up on the stave, you put your stems going downward, and you're and you're you beam it across. So what's this thing doing on top? And why is the stem going the other way? Correction, maybe. Hmm? A correction. A correction, exactly. So he's gone. Yeah, yeah, da, 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 da. And then he thinks, no, no. He plays it again. He goes, oh no, that's not right. It's yeah, da, 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 da. So his way around it is to put the B in at the top, you come on in Paul, uh, put the B on the top with the stem going the other way to indicate that it should be a B at that point. Now, let's have a look at this bar. We've got stems going in all directions. <coughs> Normally, if you look at E, D, E, G, G, D, which direction should all the stems go in? Down. Down or up? Down. Oh, you picked the wrong side of the argument to be on. No, the answer is up. Why? Why, why do stems sometimes go down and sometimes go up? Because when they reach a certain level or something. Yes, do you know what that level is? Do you know, what, what, do you know where they change over? I think over? it's translated in it. Okay. The B. Yes. The B. The third line. Okay, the conventional the music line. theory is you've got five lines. If the notes <coughs> are below this line, so it's B, A, G, F, or E on a treble clef, then you do all you do your stems going up. And if it's above that line, C, D, E, or F, or G, you, you do down. your notes, your stems coming down. Mm -hmm. The reason being that you might be you might have a, another stave quite close to this one. So you want to keep all those stems. You don't want them sort of bleeding off your stave and maybe creating mayhem somewhere else. So you want to keep them neatly on one stave. So if it's down low, you'll put them up. If it's up high, you'll put them down. So you're kind of keeping everything on the stave and not dribbling off. So it, with that in mind, what would we expect all these to be? What direction would we expect them to go in? Down. Oh. 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 Remember we said from the third line on, 
they go down. But underneath the third line, they all go up. Oh, oh yeah, up. Oh, yeah. So we'd expect them all to go up. And in fact, these two do, and these two do. But hang on a second. Why, why not those? That just completely goes against convention. They should go up. It's an E and a G. So why would he write them going down? Because there's a lot of Okay. okay, well let's see, sorry, you said because there's a, maybe because there's an ornament, and what did anybody else say? Well, he's putting signs in it in a particular place. So yes, so maybe that has something to do with it. I think you're on the right track. Anything else? Of it, so I think it's space. Oh, very good, yes. So look, uh, there's a B here written underneath it, and what's this squiggly thing above? Arrest. 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 Oh. Arrest. Ah, so other hand dress. Oh, yeah. So yeah. in fact, he's indicating two different hands. He's saying one of the hands plays this, and while one of the hands plays this, the other hand rests, and then the, presumably the original hand plays that. So what, what what's going on in a bar like this is that the stems going up are the treble hand, or if you play on your right shoulder, this hand. But for the old harpers, this hand. This is your treble hand, and this is in the face, so it's your other hand. And we know it's, so he gives us two, three indications that it's in the face because he's saying, look, your treble hand has a rest. Uh, I'm putting the stems downwards to remind you that it's not treble hand. And furthermore, I'm going to put in a big B so you know it's something to do with the face. <coughs> Why does he have to do this? Why does he have to indicate the bass like that? How is the bass normally indicated in normal music? Another line, another, yeah, you have another stave. So normally you have two staves. You have one stave for the treble, and you have one stave for the bass. But here, he doesn't have that luxury. Look, this is the size of his notebook, remember. This is all he has to go on. So if he gives one stave to the bass and one to the treble, he's only going to fit two lines of music on each page. And he has a lot more work to do. He has a lot of work to do collecting all these tunes. And clearly the bass hand isn't so important, because if it was, he would have made space for it. He's a, he's a very clever, trained musician, and it, was, it would have been no trouble for him to write down bass lines. But clearly he thought they weren't so important, so he just kept to the, kept to the tune. So he doesn't have the luxury at this point, when the tune goes into the bass. He doesn't have the luxury of writing it, so he has to write it on the same stave with a B. So, Sorry, that would actually be shown that not a lower than written there. Well, that's the question. Yeah, exactly. That's the question. So he has to write it on the same stave, but does that mean that they're actually the notes that the bass hand plays? Is it E, D, E, G, G, D, or is it E, D, E, G, G, D? And that's what we, that's what we have to kind of uh, spend lots of time thinking about and how look at a lot of the pages, play a lot of the tunes, and then we start to have ideas about where, what he means when he says bass hand. If it's at pitch, or if it's lower. And if it's lower, is it one octave lower? Is it two octaves lower? There are all sorts of possibilities. Um, excuse me. Yes. But, for example, the bass hand is written only in those two, but, yes. for example, why is there the bass hand written in the other? Yes. Oh, what an excellent question. Um, <laughs> What, what does anybody think? Those of you who have a bit more experience, why doesn't he write? Why doesn't he tell us what the bass hand's doing? Because this is this is the problem of our lives: is we don't know what they did with their bass hand, except for there are about 10, 10 or twelve tunes in this manuscript where he does. Yeah, this is one of them where he gives some bass hand indications. But why would you? Why would you not write the bass hand in? Because there's not much written in. I think that, if that there's means... not much. Sorry, just mm -hmm. what Christian said. He said, well, perhaps there's not much happening in the bass hand. And I think that's the, the truth, because if it was a polyphonic bass hand, if it was an independent line, like you get in European Baroque music, for sure, he played contrapuntal and polyphonic music all the time. So it was no, the, the idea of writing bass lines is, is not foreign to him. So I think the fact that he's not doing it means that the bass hand isn't so important. And for those of you in uh, the Cronon class and the Cheyenne Feor class, we looked at a piece uh, which is in manuscript 29, where he does give a lot of uh, bass hand indications, particularly in its other version, manuscript 33. And what we find <coughs> with the bass hand is that it's not harmonic, it's not a separate uh, uh, bass part. 
uh, Luisa, is that uh, it's just following the melody, it almost sometimes in octaves on the strong beats, or that the bass notes tend to come in, the odd bass note, where the treble hand is holding over a note. So there doesn't seem to be much independence in the bass hand, is, it, uh, is what we see when you look at lots of other tunes. But here, it's so... Because the tune is actually in the bass hand at this point and at this point, that he doesn't want to not tell us about it. So he actually says, it's this, followed by that, followed by this, followed by that. So these are when we get the real indications. Do you think the rest, the fact that there's a rest for the treble with that one, do you think that might indicate that it's actually lower? That rest. Oh, have you just gone to sleep? Right. Um, no, I don't, think, I, don't think, I don't think that has any implication for the octave. That just, yeah, he's just pointing out right. that, it, that he's giving us another indication that it's not treble hand. He's mm -hmm. saying you have a rest, it's not the treble hand. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't indicate anything for octaves, I don't think. Okay. Now let's have another look at stems up and down to indicate um, treble and bass. So this is a page. Uh, from now, is it really page 48? No, it's page 52. It's 52, isn't it? Yeah. 52. Yeah. Come on, let's check. Oh, okay. 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 Let me just check if you have the right page number. That's 52. Yeah. <coughs> All right, this is a really interesting. So now that you've seen a few easy pages, look at a, bit, a, a page which is a bit more tricky. So this is a tune called Lady of the Desert. And he says, C number 98 for remainder. Here he says, it's just off the page, but it's first VAR, first variation, and eighth lower. So the first variation, so this is a set of variations on a tune. This is the tune, those two lines. And he says the very first variation you play is an octave lower than that. And then he carries on into more variations. And it's over two pages, and then there are two more pages of variations further on in the manuscript. So uh, what I want you to notice in this is that once he puts in bar lines, he reminds himself what the bar numbers are. So he's, he has bar one, bar two, bar three. Then there's all sorts of confusion here. He thinks it's one bar, but then he comes back and says, actually, no, this is bar four and bar five, bar six, bar seven, bar eight. And he does the same in the second half. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So here we have, I think we have a similar thing. Na, 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 na. Bass. Um, ba, na, na. Now this is vertically over that. So you could think they're together. But it's when you look at other versions of the tune in this published version and cleaned up versions of this, you realize that actually all the way in this th tune there are three beats in a bar. One and two and three and one and two and three and one and two and whatever it is. So here it must be one, two, three and so beware of things that are vertical. Sometimes they're just squished up, but it doesn't really mean they're supposed to be played together. So watch out for that kind of thing. Here we have the B again, applying this to the bass. What's this cross-shaped thing? An ornament. It's an ornament. Two eighth notes. Now we have a bit of a mess. It's either with two sixteenths and an eight, or is it I can I can never decide whether this is just a blob or whether it's actually notes and stems. But usually I think it's a blob. The thing is you, you'll change your mind on these pages. The more the longer I look at these pages, the, the more things I see and sometimes I change my mind. But I think one year, I don't think the following year, I think, no, well maybe it's not a blob, maybe it is a note. What's this? Another ornament? No, this is one of 
the great frustrations of my life because I can never figure out what these are. Do you see there's another one there? And you see these all over the manuscript, you see these sort of slashy lines, and they don't appear to mean anything. Maybe, but I see these all over the place. I mean you could you could you could say yeah. yes, maybe, but uh, they're too random. They, they're, they're very random in the manuscript, and I wonder if it's something to do with using a quill pen, which I don't understand. Because, of course, he's writing not with a, you know, with a nice pen, but he's dipping a, a quill into ink and taking it over and yeah, he's checking, he's digging the quill. So maybe he's checking. I don't know. I'd have to talk. We'd have to talk to somebody who's very familiar with writing with a quill. But it might, it might be something to do with that. Um, but then they do it on the side. Yes. Well, yeah. Or but maybe this, maybe quill quills drip for something. Yeah. I don't know. It would come out in a little sort of blobby shape. Yes. And they were dripping. True. True. So I can't account for those. I, I I never really know what they are. Now th these two bars are a mess, but they're a really interesting mess. So let me talk you through them. So he starts off with. He's got stems going in both directions, so at some point he thinks it's ya da di da da, four eighth notes. And on another occasion he thinks it's ya da di da da. So I think maybe he started off thinking they were eighth notes. But why is he putting the stems upward? Well, I think because he, he, he has the stems upwards here because it's not bass, he's trying to differentiate. Because normally, for BAG up there, the stems should go down, not up. But sometimes, if you're trying to inc indicate different voices, I do it myself, you'll put stems going up and stems going down to make it clear for the eye what, uh, what the two different voices are. So it looks like he carried on with his stems going up, and then changed his mind and thought, no, it's, it's not really, na na di da, it's ya na di da. So he redoes the stem, he redoes the stem. What are these three blobs underneath? Any ideas? We've seen one of them already somewhere else in one of the other sheets. Those three things? Right, do you remember back this sheet? Thing? Remember this? The rest thing? Mm -hmm. It's a rest. So with that in mind, look at these. Do you see how it's the same thing? Mm -hmm. So we've got three <coughs> rests in a row. So I think what he's telling us here is the treble hand has these three beats to play, and the bass hand doesn't play anything at all. And then when we get into the next bars, so this is bar five from here. This is slash down to make the bar, bar line. And so he has a note here. Rest. Here's another beat, two sixteenths and an eighth adds up to another beat. 
So we're missing a third beat. Let's look at the bass. We've got, what's that? Arrest. Arrest. What's this? Arrest. Arrest. So what are these? Notes. What are the pitches of those notes? What's that one? G. G. What's this one? G. G. So it goes rest, D, G, rest. So I think we can extrapolate. I think what we're missing here is a rest in the same way that we had one there. It obviously goes one, two, and three, and the. Kind of writing, or this. 
You see the differences between them all. So what does this one say? <coughs> very very ancient. ancient. Very ancient. Sort of writing we all know. What is this writing? More ancient. Yeah. yeah. This is this is some, some Irish writing. Now um, it's not very neat and tidy, but I think it was very difficult for, for, for our Bunting to use the Irish alphabet because he wasn't familiar uh, familiar with writing. So uh, there's a shape that made that chin. Huh? There's something, something more, more that made that chin. Yeah. Uh, I knew it. Uh, it's no, it's lots of Misha. Oh. Isn't it? Well, it's not in English. I knew it. I knew it. It's, it's lots of Misha. And then carry on. Mona. It's, it must more, be Mona. More of Misha. More of, yeah. More of Misha than that made. Sorry, Brenda. Look at the door. No. Oh, no, no, you're wrong. Um, so you no see, <coughs> so there are different kinds of, just, just to say at the end, there are different kinds of, different kinds of script. We're just about done. Again, it's one of these pages where, um, yes, yeah, so often in these tunes, look, no time signature, no key signature. That's when he took a sip of wine. Yeah, yes, quite possibly. Or uh, he's just he's just too much in a rush, and it becomes obvious when you tune what the uh, what the key signature should be. Um, and look, here's his first attempt to write this tune, and then he writes this one down. Yes, he obviously didn't get this in Belfast. He says 1793, so this is the this is the next year. So look, that's just a quick a sort of quick and dirty look at a few of the pages of Bunting. Um, Take heart, if you find that quite difficult, that the more you look at these manuscript pages, the easier they get. You become familiar with the language, you become familiar with the notation and the way he does things. And so it becomes easier the more you do it. Uh, but I just wanted you to have an initial look uh, so that you gain some familiarity with it. So thank you very much. Thank you.